Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan for this. Sorry. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan for this very important press event of one humanitarian side of aspect tragedy is unfolding. So today, I'm I'm Manzurul Haq. I'm former president of the club, and our t today's guest speaker is Zhao Min Thut. You are, all of you are aware of what is happening in Myanmar and Bangladesh these days, that more than half a million refugees have crossed over border and taken shelter in Bangladesh, which is a not a rich country and which cannot afford so many uh, influx of people, but country has opened the door, opened the door because it's a humanitarian <coughs> crisis. If the door is closed, those people will be killed and, and vanished. So more than half a million, which is almost 50% of total Rohingya population. That means an ethnic cleansing is going on over <coughs> there. That uh, gross violation of human rights, genocide, and ethnic cleansing. And unfortunately, the world is responding very slowly to this. And Perhaps because not much is known what is happening there. That's why we today invited our guest speaker, who himself is from that part of Myanmar, and himself is a, is a refugee, and he's Mr. Zhao Min Thut. And please welcome him to this event. And Mr. Zhao Min Thut is Executive Director of Rohingya Advocacy Network in Japan. And he has decided to address this press event after we have one press event before where Myanmar ambassador was justifying the policy of his government. So he thought that it's better to have an, uh, a view from the victim side. And we invited him to speak over there. So I'll not prolong my introduction. So you'll hear from him firsthand what is going on over there, and then we'll have floor open for Q and A session. Mr. Zhao Min Tut. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Will you speak sitting? Or no, I'm standing. I'm standing. I'm standing. Standing. Yeah, standing so will be much better. Is, is podium over there? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really grateful for having me here at the Foreign Correspondent Clubs of Japan. I'm really appreciated. Thanks again for giving me this opportunity to speak on my suffering Rohingya people. Last 12 October, I saw the FCCJ YouTube channel, and I saw the Myanmar ambassador to Japan, former military officers, touring Tanzing was speaking in this stage. I listened from beginning to end of all his the, the view. <coughs> Actually, it was not his own view, I think. It was his government, military government's policy on Rohingyas he was explaining to the journalist here. I saw most of his facts was not correct, so I want to make sure it is correct to the international community. That is why I approached to the, the FCCJ Otherwise, the, there will be some kind of the misunderstanding on the Rohingya problem. He has, spoke, he has spoke about the Rohingya's history. At the beginning, he said, Rohingyas have been brought up to uh, today's Rakhine, 
states by the British in the British colonial era. It was totally wrong. Rohingyas have been there for centuries and centuries before that time. Before the, that place was called Rohang. And the people who have been living in that Rohang, they called it Rohingya. For example, in Japan, it is the Japan. The people who are living in Japan, we call it Japanese. For example, people living in America, we call it American. The same way, the people who have been living in Rohan, it calls the Rohingya. Actually, the Rohingyas have been settled in today's Rakhine state, dated back to 788 AD, historically. The historical evidence proves the Francis Buchanan of, of Francis Buchanan of the uh, Spain, he noted it in 1795. Mohammedans, Mohammedan because today's Muslims, who have long been settled in Arkan and who call themselves Rohingya or natives of Arkan. It is the historical facts. I bring here a lot of the historical books. And this is the books I have written myself in 2001 in Japan. I collected a lot of Rohingya's historical evidence in these books. And I want to present it to the Myanmar ambassador Turin Tanzing to study thoroughly and fairly without any prejudice or hatred. And under the British colonial era, in 1935, there was an election in Myanmar. And the Rohingya, Rohingya had been participated in that election. And again in 1947, the nation's father, Bushok Aung San, today is the Aung San Suu Kyi's father, held the National Assembly to draft the national constitution. In that assembly, two of the Rohingyas have been elected. I'm just giving you some point to understand how Rohingyas have been participated in the nation building, today's modern Myanmar build, nation building. This, before the Arkan, that was a Rakhine kingdom before 1784. That time, Rakhine Buddhist and the Rohingya Islam people have built that country. For more than 350 years, both together ruled that country. After the invasion by the Myanmar, King Budopaya, the, the today's Rakhine Arkan became a part of Myanmar. Today's Myanmar's leaders, especially the military leaders, are saying Rohingyas came to our country from Bangladesh. It is totally wrong. Rohingya didn't come to Myanmar, but Myanmar people came to Rohingya's place. It should not be forgotten by the Myanmar leaders. Myanmar got independence. Oh, sorry. Let me tell you, he said, there was only 135 ethnic minority groups in Myanmar, not included the Rohingya. So I will explain these things on the 1982 citizenship law. He, one more thing he said, in 1942 there was an incident fighting between Rohingyas and Rakhine people. Of course, yes. But he said in a one-sided story, in that time, in the British colonial era, Rohingya has been scattered around all Rakhine State. In Rakhine State, there has been there are 17 townships. There are 17 townships in Rakhine State. Rohingyas have been in all over the uh, state. 
But in 1942, when there was power backcam, British as British are withdrawing, Japanese armies are coming in. That time in Arkansas State there was power backcam for a few months. Taking that advantage, in the north southern part of Rakhine State, the Rakhine people attacked on the Rohingya people. And the Rohingya retaliated in the northern part. While the Rakhines are majority, they killed a lot of Rohingyas. While the Rohingyas were majority in northern part, they killed the Rakhine people as well. I don't say Rohingyas are sane. Rohingyas are also the human being. But he's saying Burmese people are sane. They, they never do anything wrong. In that incident, almost 80 to 100,000 Rohingyas have been killed. Almost 300 Rohingyas villages have been burned on in southern part of Arkan State. At the same time, in northern part, I don't know exactly, some the Rakhine people have been killed as well. So this was the major incident happened between Rakhine and Rohingya people. It was in 1942 because of power backcam, there was no one to rule the country. When the British are withdrawing, the Japanese uh, militaries are coming in. in. It was in the Second World War. That kind of incident have happened in other places in the world as well. So. After that, in 1948, Myanmar became independent. And in 1947, they have the uh, constitution. According to constitution, 1947 constitution, uh, the people who have been living till the Myanmar independence, all are recognized as the citizen of that country according to 1947 citizenship, 1947 constitution. And 1948 to 1962, it is Myanmar's recent history. 1948 to 1962, there was democratically elected government in Myanmar, headed by Prime Minister Unu and Ubasu. That 14 years, Rohingyas have enjoyed their ethnic rights and the human rights as well. Rohingyas have been recognized from the country's elected government and parliament as a one of the ethnic group of the country. And Rohingyas have participated in nation building, involving in the parliament. And even in 1961, one of the Rohingya became cabinet member of Prime Minister Un. Is it Rohingyas history? And at the same time, Rohingyas have been given the opportunity to broadcast their language from the ethnic, from the radio station, from the ethnic program. And also, in Rangoon University, the famous Rangoon University, there was the Rohingya Student Association registered with the Rangoon University. So there are a lot of evidence some like that. Rohingyas have been always in the Myanmar's parliament till 2014, before the 2015 election. Consecutively, Rohingya had the right to vote and to be elected as well. And unfortunately, in 1962, the xenophobic nationalist dictator Ne Win came to power with the military coup. He has started to drive out from Rangoon and from the big cities the, the foreign origin people, some like the Indian, Pakistani, and the other Westerners, and confiscating their all properties, just kick them out. It was in 1962. And no any foreigners were left in the country. And he was, from the beginning, he was a nationalist and the xenophobic. And in 1976-77, he has started a violence operation on the Rohingya people. And 
violently he attacking the Rohingya people and raping the women and uh, arresting the people and putting in the jail. And that time about 300,000 Rohingya have fled to Bangladesh as a refugees. After the intervention of international community and the Bangladeshi government intervention, those people have been repatriated in 1978-79. That time I was six or seven years old. I still remember the people are coming back. And that time he promised to the Bangladeshi government with the MOU and he will recognize those people are uh, Myanmar citizens, but he never kept his promise. And in 1982, he made a very master plan to wipe out Rohingya people. Those plan is today's military government is implementing practically. I can say practically implementing. That is the master plan in 1982. They draw up by the dictator Nguyen with the collaboration of the Rakhine academics who was the, uh, passed away late, Dr. Ajo and Dr. Mong Mong. They provided him the, some advice to do this thing, and they draw up 1982 citizenship law. This call, there are 135 ethnic groups are recognized in that 1982 citizenship law. Before 1982 citizenship law, there was 144 ethnic minority groups, including Rohingya. And they deleted Rohingya's name from the groups. They said only 135 groups of the ethnic people are the citizens of this country automatically. Who not, are not listed in 135, they are not the citizens of this country. That's it, 1982 citizenship law. But that citizenship law was not implemented till 1989. When I was 17 or 18 years old in my home, it is my own practical experience I am sharing with you, sir. And we all the Rohingya people applied for the new citizenship cards. And we hand over all our old ones. My family, my father, mother, my grandfather, grandmother, everyone who are 18 years old that time, we applied. All the Rohingyas applied, but they withhold those things till today they didn't give us and they took away our all old documents and again 1991 they started again with a violence attack on the Rohingya people saying illegal immig immigrant checking so all Rohingya become illegal immigrants without any kind of documents all our documents have been taken away and Again, that time, more than 250 Rohingyas have fled to the Bangladesh as the refugees. And in 2000, uh, 2003, again with the Bangladeshi government, and uh, they sent repatriated back to Myanmar, and they didn't give any kind of the documents. And again, in the late 1990s or early 2000, they started to issue the white card, temporary resident card. Locally, we call it white card. It doesn't mention anything about the citizenship, but Rohingyas have no option. They took it. And still they are going on. And I myself in Japan, I opposed to the UNHCR about that things. It is nothing, just they are uh, putting us in a trap. Till Rohingyas are going from, since 1990s, Rohingyas have put into an open prison. The modern day concentration camp, something like that. You know what they did? They, first of all, <clears throat> they restricted their movement. They restricted their education, their health care, their job finding, their business, their religious freedom, even their marriage. Even they are marriage. They cannot get married freely. So the people lost everything. People doesn't have any future, something like that. But in 2008, the military government draw a constitution 
that constitution uh, constitutional assembly referendum assembly rohingya people have again led to vote rohingya voted for that referendum and again in 2010 they held a election rohingya has the get the right to vote and to be elected in 2010 the usdp governments they led the parliament there was four rohingya parliamentarian sitting in the parliament till 2015 election those people are still alive some in myanmar still but before the election before the when the aung san suu kyi in 2011 by election or aung san suu kyi and the her nld entered into the parliament and the people supported the her but the military has the some the tricky idea to disturb to destabilize the country and they have started the problem in arkan state rohingyas are very soft target rohingyas are very convenient to make a target to destabilize the country today we are we become a scapegoat for the myanmar's power struggling so rohingya's lives are very precious when the, all the rohingya people have died myanmar become a real democracy believe me so myanmar leaders want those things i think so in 2012 given an excuse of a woman raped and murder case it is a criminal case whoever did these things he is a criminal even he is whoever he is so he the government must take the action legal action on them but in a state of taking the legal action they started attacking all the rohingya population in the central parts of rakhine state especially in sitwe mrau chokto pokto ratera and killed hundreds of rohingya people burning down more than 25 rohingya villages and put drive out all the rohingya from the city center to the paddy field make them in the idps now they are passing through more than 5 years without shelter without the proper the humanitarian assistance and again myanmar government has very successful attacking the violently attacking on the rohingya people they drive out all the rohingya people and again they started to attack to the international ngos who are assisting with the humanitarian aids to the rohingya people maybe you know very well msf was attacked msf the office was attacked msf the uh, staff was attacked and all the international ngos have drive out from the rakhine state and again they tried to start again in mongdo in dushiradeng killing too many rohingya people and unfortunately when they after the 2015 election dong san suu kyi he got some kind of the hit from the international community she has started to thinking about to solve this problem and she invited kofi annan and form a commission Three percent from the outside, six percent from the Myanmar, three percent from the Rakhine community. Even they make a, a commission to the to recommend to the government what should do with the Rakhine problem. And they, from the beginning, Myanmar military and USDP former government, former military officials. and the rakhine people rakhine political parties are strongly opposed on the street in the parliament in everywhere opposed not to form the this commission because they know this commission if this commission formed everything will be revealed by the commission because they are very highly qualified people and dong san suu kyi she never listen to those the opponent and she go forward and it was in august 2016 and 2000 uh, sorry uh, for after one month suddenly 
We got the, the news, the, some of the Rohingya youths attacked on the police post on 2016, uh, October 9, and killing nine police people. We are really regretted, whoever lost their lives. And Rohingya people have been shocked. How comes, who did these kind of things? And Myanmar military government, military and police forces, together with the extremist Rakhine vigilantes, started attacking the Rohingya people. And too many people have been killed. More than 1,000 people have been killed. 1,000 people have been arrested. Hundreds of Rohingya women have been raped. Children have been put into the fire even. When they, they, they touch the houses, the people inside the houses are running away and they shoot the people. And the more than 25 Rohingya villages have been abandoned, including my own house. In that incident, one of my second cousins have been killed. It is my own practical the experience I am sharing with you. You should not do that like that. But I'm a little bit emotional when my people get killed. I cannot be silent. Nobody hired me to come and to tell about my people's suffering. It is a genocidal process. It is the genocidal last stage. This genocidal stage was started since 1978. It is the last stage. Their policy is to, to drive out the Rohingya people out of the country. And even the United Nations experts visiting there and interviewing the victims in Bangladesh. And they said it is a genocide. It's a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Even the France president at the UN General Assembly, he declared is it a genocide. If it is not a genocide, please tell me what is this? Please tell me what is this? Killing the whole community. Driving out all one, more than one million community and forcing them to take NVC card. It has become a very big problem with the Rohingya people. And we know what is the NVC cards. NVC cards means, first of all, you take these, these NVC cards and you agree, I am not from here. I am from outside. And if you want to stay in this country, you can apply for the citizenship. And they will verify it. Who? Myanmar government will verify it. And if they agree, you will give a citizen of the country or naturalized citizens. So it is, becomes a very big issue for the Rohingya people. Rohingya people are not the eager. They are not interested in the, this day when we seek Because Rohingya people, we are saying, our generations and generations have been living in this country. We are already this citizen of this country. Why we need the NVC cards? Before you give us the temporary cards, promising us giving me, us the, the citizenship cards, you didn't give the citizenship card and you withdraw their things. And again, you started a new process. We don't know how long it will take. So we are not getting this thing. Now today, who are living in the country, they are forcing, blocking their aids, blocking their foods, and the announcing in the uh, loudspeaker to go Bangladesh if you don't accept the NNVC cards. It is the way the remaining people, remain already more than 600,000 are in the Bangladesh, remaining are forcing to go to the Bangladesh. Killing the children. Now in the Bangladesh camps, more than 15, thousand Rohingya orphans without the, the parents, children more than 15,000. So where are their parents? They have been killed or they have been put in the jail. They will be killed in the jail as well. So please, it is a genocide, I want to say. It is really a genocide. 
So it is the 21st century. We already witnessed in 94, 95 in Bosnia and Rwanda how it can happen again in 21st century in front of the international community. I want to appeal to the international community, please save my people from the hand of genociders. Myanmar military, who is responsible, is General Ming Aung Lai and his collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Tudut. Thank you. And now, floor is open for Q&A session. And please raise your hand, and when you're identified, come forward, and also give your identity before asking the question. And please, at the beginning, just remain one question at first, maybe at the end. P.O., please, yes. Thank you for uh, your presentation. <coughs> the issue is a very old one, but the last tragedy started from this uh, August attack in Rakhine State. <coughs> Do you have any direct information or what are your personal feelings toward uh, that attack? Who did it? Why did it? And who are these uh, self-proclaimed uh, Arakan uh, Liberation Army? Are they Rohingya? Thank you very much. When August 25th, last August 25th incident was happened, I was not in Japan, neither I was not in Myanmar, I was in Saudi Arabia. And I was waiting for the Kofi Annan Commission on 24th in the hotel, in Saudi Arabia, in hotel. From my mobile, in the 24th, in the evening, I saw his, the, the report, the Kofi Annan report, and I was so happy. And I contact some of my f fellow friends in the other countries, and I said, you have to uh, study this thing properly or something like that. I was so happy, and I was sleeping very peacefully. From the early morning of 25th, I again opened my mobile, and I saw some of the very shocking the news, uh, attacking more than 30, the police post, uh, by the Rohingya people, the news were spreading to the wall. And I was a little bit wondering, how comes on 24th of the Kofi Annan Commission recommendations come out presented to the president and the state councillors in the early morning of 25th, how comes the attack coming in? Since 2016 incident, in 2017, almost one year, there was no that kind of attack happened. How comes in the day of the Kofi Annan Commission? I was a little bit wondering about that. And one more thing, before I left Japan for Saudi Arabia, I have the information and I got the news from the ground. Before, one week before, there were more than two or 3,000 military personnel have been the discharge to Rakhine State by four helicopters and two gun, two, two sorry, two gun ships uh, to Rakhine State before 25th August incident happened. Happen. Yeah, so it was a pre-planned incident, not the the suddenly happened. I think. Even though there was the, some, the Rohingya people have been uh, the involved, I doubt it. those Rohingya people are not the interest of the Rohingya people. Might be someone using for some interest. I don't know exactly, but I know some of the Rohingya people. And at the same time, I also think the Rohingya, the young, Rohingya's youth are, especially youths, are very des desperate. They don't have the future. Becoming adult, 20, 25, 30 years old, no future in the country. Might be the things, if we attack the 
police post or the uh, military post or something like that, maybe our, the government will give us serious attention to our plight. Maybe they uh, talk like that. So I contact a lot of my the contact on the ground, but nobody can give me the exact the answer who did the, these things. So we got a lot of the uh, information on the uh, so-called ARSA, A-R-S-A, Arkan Salvation Army. Arkan Rohingya Salvation Army. It might be the desperate Rohingya youths are doing the, this kind of things. I think the, it should not given the collective punishment to the innocent Rohingya people because of the wrong deed by the ALSA. I believe. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay, please, yes. Siegfried Knittel, freelancer from Germany. We met us two years ago at your uh, office and uh, I had made an interview. So my question today is, uh, how do you see Aung San Suu Kyi's role? Is she a puppet of the military or is she someone who thinks, it's, I, th I think it's some, some report about her personality. She is a very strong person and following a, a kind of a long time strategic, strategic plan to modernize Burma, Burma uh, to, uh, and then she thinks on the long way several something happened and so a lot of people perhaps will die until we come to this kind of modern, modern uh, Burma. How do you think, is she only a puppet or has she a long time uh, strategy? I am one of the inspiration of the Aung San Suu Kyi. I have a lot of respect for her from the heart, from the bottom of my heart. I really respect her. She's really a qualified, sincere leader for us. But in the case of Rohingya, she cannot overcome, I think she cannot overcome the military power. As I said before, there are the power struggling in the country. There are two governments in our country right now. Most of the people said, oh, Aung San Suu Kyi is the state councillor, the Myanmar become a real democracy and it will be really good for the business or everything. But it is wrong information. Believe me, it is wrong information. Aung San Suu Kyi wanted to develop the country, to modernize the country from the beginning. But it is the obstacle by the Myanmar military. As you know, Myanmar military are very powerful. So she is trying to negotiate or to the, what you call it? Appease. Uh, yeah, to appease the militaries. But in Rohingya cases, I'm wondering how comes she trying to cover up military atrocities on the innocent Rohingyas? She is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Everyone in the world are look up to her. So in the 19th September, I had one thing, and again 12 October in this place, Myanmar ambassador says there is no any human rights problem in the country. Is it funny for you or is it shameful for me? Is it really funny? Myanmar, the whole world is saying, United Nations is saying, Myanmar has the grave human rights problem. Now today, in front of international media, he said there is no human rights problem in the country. I was shocked how comes this kind of a statement he can give irresponsibly. So, there are a lot of human rights problems, not only on the Rohingya people, I'm saying. You, if you go to the Kashin estate, if you go to the Shan estate, if you go to the Xin estate, you see the Xin problem, you see the Kashin problem. There are a lot of human rights problems. All are generated from the army, from the military. So you need to understand how the military is powerful in the country. Without military's permission, Aung San Suu Kyi cannot do anything. I think like that. 
But she want, still she wanted to develop the country. She, she want to give the people a future, a good future. But military is the main obstacle. But in, on the Rohingya's case, she, for the, a lot of people, she becomes a collaborator with the, the military. OK, floor is open again. Anyone would like to ask a question? Meanwhile, I have one question. Yeah. That's as people okay. might, might get ready for okay. the next question. Okay. What is Aung San Suu Kyi's attitude to Kofi Annan Commission? Because she formed the commission. And commission submitted the report. And how she is dealing with the report now? I think <clears throat> she immediately she issued an, a statement from the uh, state consular office accepting and she was so happy on the reports. She agreed almost all the recommendation. But the problem is, the problem is to implement, how to implement these things. When she going to implement the, this, the recommendations, I think the Myanmar military leadership and the Rakhine nationalist will oppose her. For example, in the Kofi Annan Commission, the main issue she, he said was to amend the 1982 citizenship law, which is contradictory to the international citizenship law, international community. He, he, he strongly recommend to end, but till today, nobody is talking about that. Nobody is talking about that. I think she will try to implement some very uh, small things to show the wall. Oh, I'm doing. Now he's, she's also saying, no, I'm doing, just starting to implement the Kofi Annan Commission. Because when she is speaking about the Kofi Annan Commission, the international community say, yeah, good, 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 good. But the problem is, when she is going to implement these things, the Myanmar military and Rakhine nationalist political party and the Buddhist monk, the Rak <clears throat> let me say one thing here. The Military is now hiring the Buddhist monks, not the Buddhist real monk. Now the Myanmar has the nationalism is very high, very high, the highest level in the world now nationalism in the country. And he, they are also using Buddhist monk, so-called monk, not real monk. Buddhist never teach to be violence to other people. But today's Myanmar's some monks are openly teaching hatred. You see, one, give me a, let me give you an example. After August incident in the Rakhine state, nobody is allowed to go. Even the United Nations officers, even the ambassadors in the Myanmar, nobody is allowed, given the security concern. The security concern, you are not allowed to go there. No any media are allowing. No humanitarian groups are allowing to assist. But monk Wiratu, the, the Burmese uh, uh, Buddhist bin Laden, he was escorted by military to visit to Rakhine Estate in Mongdo and Butidong. And he inflaming the hatred. So, the, these people are obstructing the Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, she cannot get the point to implement the Kofi Annan. It will be really a difficult task for her. Okay, now again, floor is open. Yes, Gabbard, please. Gebhard Hilcher, also a, a journalist from Germany, but al already very old, so I'm, shall we say, I was never in charge of covering Burma or Myanmar, so uh, I have uh, a lot of uh, questions to ask if I wanted to know more about it, but uh, wh where do you think, what is the root of the discriminatory behavior by the military vis-a-vis -vis you, and why do you think uh, your current 
country's president is more or less covering up the situation which you are describing, uh, which reminds me of what the Germans did to the Jewish people uh, centuries, uh, uh, this early and this last century. So uh, it is, is it just racialism or is it religious an element or is it just a power struggle? Where do you see the real motive why they're trying to get rid of you, so to speak? <clears throat> the current military uh, have the very the, the current military leadership have been trained by the former military leadership. They are still following their the ideology. They are not only problem with the Rohingya people, with the military. They have the problem with the Kashim people, Karen people, and the other Singh people, and Shan people, and are with the other people as well. On top of that, Rohingyas are becomes very soft targeted. So if Rohingya, they can get rid of the Rohingya people, they think they did it will be a very good moral support. They can garner from the the mass the mass uh, public people, the majority Burmese people. So they are uh, playing some kind of the religious the issue, and some are uh, playing with the ethnic issues, and on top of that, the political issue is more important. Politically, they are they doing the, this kind of things. So, the, regarding the civilian civilian leadership, they knows their position very well. They knows their power, how much they can do. So they don't want to confront with the military leadership. Mind analysis. They, for example, the Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD leadership, they don't want to confront with the, the military leadership. So they want to uh, peacefully uh, transfer the country uh, into the real democracy. But it is not, it will not be easy. It will be, uh, it, I think it is a, a wrong decision. For me, it is a wrong decision. It, it should not go to, uh, like that. It will not go to the, uh, the, the goal. Pio, if you wanted one more. A part of uh, the government of Bangladesh, who's doing uh, a lot nowadays, the Prime Minister of uh, Bangladesh uh, has put at stake uh, her own international credibility in order to at least temporarily host uh, your people. I come from a country, Italy, where we are at the center of the migration issue, you know? And uh, what strikes me as, uh, I'm not a Christian, I'm atheist, but what's uh, uh, closer to Buddhism, I would say. Uh, but what really wonders me is why no other Muslim country, because you're Muslim. Yeah. What is uh, Muslim solidarity? Where is Muslim help for these people? I mean, those people that have taken the sea in the past has not been able to be harbored by any country. Not in Indonesia, not in Malaysia, not there, staying there, at disposal of sharks and pirates. And in Bangladesh, I know right now, there are several international um, voluntary um, organization, like uh, a part of a UN, but they're like MOAS of Malta, um, Emergency and Medicines on Frontiers. But I'm not hearing of a, a strong commitment by the international Muslim community. Yes. So are you a paria even for Muslims? I don't think so. Okay. First of all, I want to stand up and gave my big salute to the Bangladeshi people and the Bangladeshi government and the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Thank you. I really appreciate their hospitality, their help, their opening heart and everything. At the same time, as you ask me, we are not the pariah for the Muslim countries. But as you know, most of the Muslim countries are in the Middle East. 
their plate is already full with their own problem. I think. And <clears throat> regarding the Malaysia and Indonesia, they are not doing enough to help the Rohingya people. Because they are member of the ASEAN community. So they have to look their own interests as well. It is our bad luck. Everybody is, if everybody is looking into their own interest, so who will see vulnerable people's interest? I don't think we are burdened for this world. We are the human being as you and everyone. We are not the burden. But people, the countries have their own interest and their own policy and their standard. For example, United States, even the state, the Secretary Tillerson, he said, it is the responsibility of the Myanmar military leadership of the, this genocide or the ethnic cleansing. He declared it. When you compare with the Japanese foreign ministry's the statements, I bring it for you here. <laughs> so it is the own, the different country has different policy and a standpoint and view on these things. I'm not saying Japanese, the government is not doing anything, but they're doing something. But it is not enough. As a government, a strong government, a big government, and the ASEAN, the biggest, the democratic government, and the wealthiest country, Japan has a lot of leverage on the Myanmar, giving a lot of the ODA and the other assistance, and they have the, some the strong point the, to stop the, this kind of the atrocities. But Japanese government is not playing that rule at all. Even last week months, I visited to the foreign ministry and we have spoke like, more than one hour with the Japanese foreign ministry and we appeal again and again to them. But their statements, when I, we see their statements and we are very upset on that. So we have need to work more harder and to convince the Japanese government to take a leading role, leading part to solve the, this day, the 21st century is the biggest humanitarian crisis in the world going on. How can you be silent like this? Giving the four million US dollar donation for the refugees, not enough. You need to get some the political the, uh, the message to give the, to the Myanmar military and the others. You must stop the, this kind of the atrocities on the innocent people. I'm not taking part with the bad people uh, who the, commit the crimes, killing a people, person, whoever the, is the a crime. Right? But, for example, if I, I, do a, I did a crime and you giving the punishment to hold my family is not a, a fair thing. Now the Rohingya people are suffering in this kind of punishment, collective punishment. It is a very good point for the international community to uh, stop the, this kind of things, the things. So when you are, uh, some people are talking about now the Bangladesh government, the, the Home Minister is visiting today or tomorrow to Myanmar to talk about the repatriation. I think it is not very, very premature. Because the situation is still very volatile in the country, in Myanmar. How you repatriate those people? Those people will not be come back. They are really frightened. They are still threatening to kill all the people. How comes? OK, if you put the, the UN peacekeeping forces on the ground to protect the, these the people, the security and everything, so the people will come back. And you know the Myanmar government, when the people left to the country, they were Bangladesh, they started talking about, uh, according to the Myanmar law, when some building is the burned on, the land become the national land, not the, no, the ownership. So it is the Myanmar law. They are talking, starting talking about this thing. So 300 Rohingya villages have been burned on it everything so people know they are so the 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 this the, 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 the property land are becoming the government state land. government lands 
So when the people are coming back, why are they will stay? Why are they will stay? They are trying to put all in the IDP camps and forcing every single one to take the NVC cars. First, you confess yourself, you are Bengali. Second, you are from Bangladesh. You are trying to get the citizenship in this country. So the people are not accepting these things, and they are threatening again and again on that point. Okay, one last question from Japanese journalist, if there is any question, <coughs> because a lot of things talk, talked about Japan. Any Japanese? Yes, please. Koji Igarashi, I'm freelance. And I've been wondering what kind of relation you Rohingya refugee people in Japan have had and with the Burmese refugee community in this country. Uh, do they show, at least some of them show some kind of understanding or sympathy toward your difficulties or not? Thank you very much, Sensei. <laughs> oh. It is very hard question since you asked me. Since I came to Japan, I have a lot of Burmese friends who worked together with me for the Burma's democratization and human rights for everyone. Since 1999. We, I have very close friends even. But I don't know what is the main reason exactly those the Burmese community people are not collaborating, not cooperating with us. And they are not letting us even to cooperate with them. So most of the Burmese community in Japan as well, they think they are the thinking their opinion are the same as the Myanmar military. I can say Myanmar military's position and the Burmese, the community in Myanmar uh, are almost the same. They see us in outsider. So even when I was not here, the, uh, some of the international people, including with the, our Rohingya community members, went to demonstrate in front of the Myanmar embassy against the Myanmar government to stop the, these atrocities and genocide. And some of the Myanmar community members came to the place at the demonstration and tried to stop the demonstration even. So they don't want even to give us free expression even in Japan. They want to restrict our the freedom of the expression even in Japan. So I'm very regret I feel really regret to say about my colleagues, my former colleagues, my friends. Even some friends are still, I have a few words speaking, but not like before. I don't know why, what reason behind that. So these books, when I show you at the beginning, this was not my the, uh, hobby to writing. It was forced by my, some of my Burmese friends to write the, these books. When I came to Japan, there was some of my friends asking about the Rohingya's history, and I said Rohingya's history like this. And he said, yeah, you know very well these things, and you compile this, all the documents and make books. It would be good for us to study about the Rohingya people. And with the encouragement of my Burmese people, Burmese friends, I wrote these books in Burmese language to a study in the Burmese easily about the Rohingya's history. So those friends even don't want to talk to my Rohingya people. This is very regrettable. OK, thank you very much. Our time is now over. And here we end today's press conference. Thank you. And once again, thank you, Mr. Thut, thank and for this much. very encouraging thank speech. And we much. all wish Rohingya problem to be solved amicably. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining.